Well, it's good to be with you again tonight. Um, I don't know if I grabbed this sometime today, but I have in, on my Bible. Did I pick this up and put it in my Bible somewhere today? A letter addressed to here to Nathan Easley? Was that okay? I grabbed it in my notes. Then I'm, I, I will uh, set it here. So I, I looked at that at my desk this afternoon. I thought, what in the world? Where? The? And finally, I thought, you know, that must have been on the pulpit. And I scooped it up on my no, with my notes. So glad it wasn't a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> well, thank the Lord uh, for meeting with us this morning, and He's meeting with us again tonight. Um, now, as you folks know, I am new at uh, preaching, and one of the things I have to remember to do is track the time. And this morning, I felt like I had gone on and on and on, and, uh, and uh, I thought I was getting a sign from somebody that, hey, you're over time. I don't, but anyway. Um, I got done. I thought, well, I don't. I that, was, that wasn't very long at all. I thought I was bad. So I, I don't have a good sense of time when I get to preaching. So I'm going to try to watch my watch here and and uh, have a not be in too much of a hurry, but not keep you too long. So if you have your your Bibles with you, um, if you would turn to Second Corinthians chapter six, verse seventeen. Second Corinthians. Chapter 6 and verse 17. Let's stand in honor to God's word. First, our second Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 17, says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Dear Lord, I pray that you would bless now tonight in the preaching of your word. I pray that you would be with me, Lord, and help me to say all the things that you want me to say. Lord, I pray in nothing that you would not have me to say. Bless the listening ears and help me to get your truth across in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight's message I would title Proficient in Your Profession. In, in the aviation industry, uh, there are two terms that we use quite a bit, and one is proficient and the other is legal. And there is a difference between being legally qualified to perform a flight function and being proficient in doing that. And I'll give you one example is if you're piloting an airplane with passengers, the requirement legally is that you have to have, in the preceding 90 days, you have to have taken off and landed at, to a full stop at least three times. Now, I don't know how much flying you've done but if I was flying with somebody that in 90 days had only taken off and landed three times, um, that's not proficient. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, I was flying years ago flying in, in, I had a Bonanza, a little four seat airplane, and I was in Bentonville visiting the folks over there and the starter went out and uh, we found one in Tulsa. And uh, the, there was a guy there I was going to rent, they had a little four-seater 172, and I was going to rent that, but in order to do that, you have to get checked out and, and the rental cost and all that. They said, you know, it'll be cheaper if you just let one of our guys fly you over there and get it. He's trying to build time. He's a commercial pilot, new commercial pilot. He's trying to build time, and he won't charge you anything, just, you know, the rental of the airplane. I said, that sounds wonderful. So we flew over to Tulsa, and it was a gusty, windy Oklahoma day. And as we're coming down on final, the wind's blowing us around, and that old boy, you could just feel him, was as nervous as he could be, you know, working the controls. And about two-mile final, he, he kind of looked over at me and said, I just want to apologize right now. It's probably not going to be a very good landing. <laughs> <laughs> and he was exactly right. <laughs> he hit the nail on the head. He uh, bounced and bounced and bounced, and eventually we bounced to a stop. But he was legal to fly that trip, but he was not proficient in his profession. 
Uh, the Bible tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, <clears throat> rightly dividing the word of truth, there's uh, a few speculations uh, on what that means, and there's, there's some scholars that will tell you he's, he's talking about um, splitting the, uh, when the high priest would cut the sacrifice, and as they would divide it, they're, they're uh, very precise in how they would divide the sacrifice and separate it. And, and that's kind of the, a technical part of what he's talking about. But I don't, I don't believe that that is, and most scholars do not believe that's what he's talking about. It is the common interpretation of being approved. Study, show yourself to prove unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Knowing God's word and knowing when and how to give God's word to somebody. We as Christians should be proficient in our profession. There is no other profession that is as serious and as, and as important as that of a Christian. I remember several years ago I was uh, training to do my instrument training in Bentonville. And I had come up here taken about a month off work and I had flown as a private pilot for about eight years and had my own airplane. And I had gotten to the point where I was breaking a lot of rules because I was comfortable flying and I, I would, uh, you're not supposed to fly at all in the clouds, what we call, you know, instrument meteorological conditions. But I would, because I had to go, I felt like when I go, so I'd climb up in the clouds, you know, and, and fly and and uh, I would d try to dive bomb at the airport because I didn't know how to do any of the approach plates. And I just figured, well, right over the airport, there's not going to be anything there. So I'll just get over the airport, kill, you know, pull the power back and dive bomb. And if I don't find the airport within about 500 feet of the ground, I'll, you know, swoop back up. So I did that for a couple years the, and, and until somebody finally talked to me, uh, Brother Boardman actually, up in my brother's church in Iowa, and explained how unethical that is to do that because of other people up there that are flying by the rules, you know. So, well, I uh, started my training with a, he was an airline pilot, uh, and on his days off he taught. And one day we were flying, and I didn't realize this, but he had picked up on the fact that I wasn't a, a rule keeper. And uh, when we were flying back to the airport, we were training, it was a perfectly good, clear day, and he said, do you have enough fuel to make it back? And I said, I didn't even look. I said, yeah, we got plenty of fuel. And he said, you sure about that? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what's the requirement? And I said, well, to got to fly to the airport and then have in IFR and fly, have 45 minutes of fuel after. And he said, do you have that? And I said, oh, sure, but even if I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a clear day. It doesn't matter, you know. And he said, okay. So we got to the airport, and I figured I'd, you know, explained it to him, and he was happy with it. And uh, we went to do our debriefing, and he sat down, and uh, he told me, he said, <clears throat> he, he said something that changed my entire career in aviation. And uh, he told me, and we had almost become friends at this point, he said, Here's the, here's the deal. He said, you do have skill as a pilot. He said, but your decision making is going to get yourself and somebody else killed. And he said, you have a choice to make. He said, but I am not going to be your instructor anymore until you decide to start keeping the rules or go find yourself a different instructor. And that was the end of the debriefing. And I was not saved, much less sanctified. And I was not happy because I felt like I pretty much had the world by the tail in, that, in the air. And I went home, I was staying at Britt and Jessica's house while I was training there, and uh, I was fuming. But as the night wore on and I thought about that, all of a sudden it, it clicked in my head that, you know what, I want to do this for a living. This is, it is serious business and I need, I need to take this serious. And uh, I called Vic the next day and I told him, I said, I flipped the switch in my head. I said, I'm done. I'm done, as we call it, being a cowboy. I'm, I'm done being a cowboy. I'm, I'm ready to buy. He said, all right, if you're ready, then, uh, then I'll keep training you. Well, my fast forward through the training, my first flight after I got my instrument rating, I flew into Dallas, and it was late at night, and uh, it was low clouds, uh, really bad weather. And when I landed, the, the landing uh, or the uh, avionics lights went out. So I taxied in and I wanted to get back home and I thought,
you know, I can put maybe a headlamp on or something, you know, I can figure this out, I, you know. And I called Britt and I said, um, what do you think, man, should I take off? And uh, he said, man, I think, I think Vic would be uh, proud of you if you decided to stay and wait, wait till daylight. And, but, you know, your lights are already out. If something else happened, you know, it could be tragic. So I said, okay, so I stayed. The next morning I got up, it was still low clouds, but it was daylight. I didn't need the lights in the cockpit. And I took off and just as I got in the clouds and center gave me a turn to a certain heading, I looked at my attitude indicator, which is your artificial horizon, what you fly by, and it was upside down. And uh, I, I mean, I thought there's no way that I flipped upside down that quick. And I looked at some other instruments that looked right, and my turn coordinator looked good, my GPS looked good, and I looked back, and it was still upside down. And uh, I, I, I thought, what, you know, what in the world is going on? And uh, so I thought, well, I've got my compass, my GPS, my turn coordinator is good, so I'll fly by that, and and not the which is what you're trained to do, and not the uh, not the attitude indicator. Well, I was about 25 minutes or so in IMC weather. They were vectoring me all around. Finally, I climbed and got out of it. And the, the vacuum pump had sheared as I took off on that airplane. I lost all my vacuum instruments. And it, it, I thought about, you know, if I would have done that last night, I probably with just maybe a spotlight on my head, I wouldn't have been able to see everything like that and, and keep the airplane level and make the turns and may very likely have not survived that flight. But what kept me alive is abiding by the rules and being proficient. I was right out of training and I was very proficient in that airplane. But I bring our attention again to God's word that tells us to study to show yourself approved unto God. It is an embarrassment in your career, in your professional career, to not be proficient in your profession. If I were to tell you that uh, if you were to come on board my airplane or if I was to go to your place of work and you were to tell me, well, you know, sometimes I get this right, sometimes I don't, you know, we'll see how it goes. You wouldn't have any faith in me, and I wouldn't have any faith in you. If you didn't know your job, especially if it was an important job inside and out, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with you. I would, I would call somebody else. And so it is with this world. Sometimes I think the devil puts on our minds that the world is looking for a watered-down religion that fits them. But... The world is not looking for that. The world that is ready for Jesus, God, the Bible tells us that God deals with the sinner and prepares their heart for God. And somebody that is really looking for, for Jesus and a change, they don't want a watered down religion. They don't want what they've got with, well, now we'll claim that we're, we're, we're saved too and a, a sort of sinning religion, which is working its way into the holiness movement. And we have people at our Bible colleges now, and I've only been saved a year and a half. I did not even know this until recently. But we have professors in our Bible college telling kids they can't be truly delivered from inbred sin. That is an absolute shame. The devil couldn't come up with anything any better than that. Brother, I don't know. Do y'all know Brother Marshall Smart? He's passed now, but he was a, one of the last of the old, old-time evangelists. And Brother Marshall Smart held us a couple revivals and the waters a couple revivals before he passed. He passed a few years ago. He was 90-something years old. But Brother Smart had a message called, If I Was the Devil. And... Um, a, few, a few of you, I don't know if you've heard it, it's a lot of people have heard it over the, over the years, but he goes through what he would do, and one of the first things he would do is tell you that you can sin and still make it to heaven. Of course, from a strategic standpoint, that's exactly what I would do if I was the devil. I would convince you that you're perfectly okay, but you really can't be delivered from sin. You can't be delivered from inbred sin. The devil, that is a... a a uh, strategy, that's a theology that is drudged up from hell itself. Don't ever believe that. One of the biggest reasons I know it's false is because God delivered me from sin. And he took the sin nature out of my heart. And like, like that song says, don't ask the man who's, who's, who, now I can't remember, don't ask the man that can walk and that can see um, uh, if, or try to tell him that Jesus isn't real. Don't tell me that you can't be delivered from sin because I was bound by sin. You know, I testified a few weeks ago in our home church 
that the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. And that is true. In my life, the season of pleasure had long passed. And for years, I would go to our camp meetings. I would attend church every Sunday. And I longed for that relationship that I saw my dad have, my mom have, my brother have, Brother Hayford have, the leaders in our church. I longed for the fellowship that they shared with one another. But I was bound by sin, and the pleasure of sin had far gone from my life. But Jesus Christ still delivers from sin, and the Holy Ghost still fills the heart and cleanses from inbred sin. Don't allow the devil to tell you to what you can water down your religion to make it acceptable to the world. That's not what I was looking for. If my mom or dad, who were our, my mom is still my hero and my dad was, if they would have watered down their religion or told me, well, Caleb, you know, we've maybe been holding the line a little too hard. You can, you can do that. You can do this. Well, you know, maybe you, you know, Lord will look past that. That, I would have been the most disappointed person on this earth in, in, in that. I didn't want that. What I wanted, I couldn't free myself from sin, but what I wanted is complete deliverance from sin and the nature of sin. We need to be proficient in our profession. If you are not proficient in your profession, if you are not where you know that you should be, you can get there very, very easily. But there is a dying world that is relying on each and every one of us to stand in the gap, as the Bible says, and make up the hedge. I don't know uh, if you all know um, Dr. Uh, David Gibbs, but he's the Gibbs that started the ACE schooling. And Dr. Gibbs gives an illustration of a preacher friend of his that was, had flown into an airport and a friend picked him up and they were headed into town and it was dark late at night and they were crossing a bridge and they, they thought they saw something up ahead in the bridge. They thought they saw somebody in the road. It was a two-lane bridge. And as they got closer, he slowed down. Sure enough, there's some crazy man standing in the bridge, waving his arms and going crazy. And uh, they, it was, I think, the wee hours of the morning at this point. And they thought, well, he's probably drunk or on drugs or something. And they kind of went to swerve around him. And he jumped and got in their way. And they thought, man, this crazy guy, you know, and they tried to go around him and got right up to him. And finally, and he jumped right up on their hood. And uh, <clears throat> they, they finally were forced to stop. And... And he was yelling at him, stop, 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 stop. They could hear him now stopped. And uh, they thought, well, I don't, you know, I don't think he's panicked. You know, he's not drunk or on drugs. And he said, what in the world is the matter, man? What are you doing? You could get hit, you know. And he said, the bridge up here has just collapsed. And it's a bridge with an with a arc in it. And he said, there's a car that already went over. And he said, I almost went over. I stopped my car and run back here to try to stop other people from going over the bridge. That is where we should be in the place of this world. This world is going to hell, and most of them don't even know it. And we are called by God to be proficient and to, be, to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Is, is your religion up to date? That's a, a place that uh, in the church we find a lot of people is... And who was it that I think Brother Waters just preached a message on this of how comfortable that we are in this day and age. And you, <clears throat> you think about all the comforts of life and how easy it is for us to get comfortable and to feel good because we're going to church. And we live a pretty good life. And I'll be honest with you, living a clean, good life, it does feel good. That's just, just your human psychology. You feel good about it. But do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're ready and that you're ready to help somebody else make it to heaven. That's where we're called to be. Not just to be ready ourselves, but to be ready to make it to heaven. To be proficient and not water down our religion from anybody. When my For anybody. When my dad was in the Navy, he I, you may have heard his life story, but when my dad was in the Navy, he first got in there and he ran across this fellow that said he was a Christian and dad tried to ask him about what he believed in and what, you know, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And the old boy just apologized all over himself for being a Christian and my dad was 19 years old and raised wild and wooly and didn't know anything did not know that Jesus Christ was the son of God literally had no idea but he walked away from that fellow and he thought if I ever become a Christian 
I'm never going to get whatever that guy's got. That's what the sincere heart thinks if you're trying to water down your religion and live a watered down religion. That's not, that's not what the world wants. That's what the devil wants you to think they want. But God, delivered from, God delivers from sin. Sin is still sin. Don't let this idea that's, like I said, creeping our, its way even into the holiness movements uh, confuse you. Sin is still sin. And we, I think I, it's been a long time since I've heard a message naming sin. But some of you remember years ago when I was little, preachers used to get up and talk about smoking and drinking and gambling and, and all the sins of their, you don't hear that much anymore. It's like we're scared to death to, to offend somebody. But the world needs clear leadership. You know what I needed when I was out cowboying around in that airplane? I needed somebody like Vic to say, hey, listen here, bud. You're going to kill yourself, and I'm not going to be a part of it, okay? So that's what I needed. That's what probably saved my life a few months later in Dallas because somebody had the fortitude to stand up and tell me, you're headed down the wrong road, and I'm not going to be a part of it. We don't want to do that in harshness or at all, but in love. And that's what exactly what Vic was doing, was telling me, because we were friends at that point, and he cared about me, but he, was, he had the courage to stand up and, and tell me, you're headed in the wrong direction. We have to be able to do that. Don't let the devil quiet your voice, quiet your, your uh, message of salvation and your testimony. The... Uh, and I'm still trying to learn to talk and read my notes at the same time. So I've got to catch up here on my notes. So are you approved unto God? That scripture says, do you know that you're following that scripture approved unto God? This is something I've been praying ever since really I got saved is, am I approved unto God? I feel so helpless when you think about this world and so many encounters I have and I leave and I think Lord help me to know how to how to testify help me to know how to spread the gospel help me to know how how to be approved do you really approve of how I'm living how I'm acting how I'm reaching out to others are you approved unto God how do you know if you are ask God that's the, that's, that's the difference, you know, between our God and every other God is you can't prove that the other gods of the world don't hear. You can't prove that beyond any shadow of a doubt. But what we do know is they cannot answer prayer. That is where Jesus Christ, our God, ha what he has above every other God is he answers our prayers. <clears throat> if you don't know if you're approved unto God, Ask him, pray, call upon him. He will answer your prayers. He will answer you. You can be exactly where you should be and approved unto God. Seek him and he will be found, the Bible says. Stand in the gap and make up the hedge is the challenge that we have in this world. Don't let anybody or anything, this world, the, the political climate that we're in, discourage you from your, as I said earlier, your testimony of true salvation and deliverance from sin. <clears throat> Let me um, apologize again from, can't hardly read my own writing here. I've got one. All right, one, one more illustration to give you in closing. The... Uh, Years have passed. Obviously, I've been I've been flying now for about 14 years, and the the one thing I looked at as being a hindrance to flying was the rules and regulations. A lot of times in the church, I think we view that, and especially we think young people view that as a hindrance, the rules and the regulations. But it is the very rules and regulations that God puts in His Word that keep us flying in this Christian life. If you astray from God's word or try to get away from this, make up your own religion like so many are doing today, you're not going to make it. In this now, after 14 years of flying, if you got, in the, we fly Learjets and you have to have two pilots in Learjets. And if you were my co-pilot and you got in the right, in the right seat with me, and you started telling me, oh, 
you don't have to do that. You don't have to keep that rule, man. I've, I've been doing this for years. I, you know, don't, don't worry about that. You know, no, don't, you know, I know it says, you know, turn on the bleed air, you know, for icing, you know, under 10 degrees, blah. don't worry about that. I've, you know, <clears throat> you started going down that road with me now, 14 years ago, I'd have said, oh, okay, good. Let's break all the rules. Now, knowing what I know and seeing all the accident studies that we do year after year in training, I'd say, listen, <laughs> you're either going to get out or you're going to keep the rules. That's how this flight's going to go. I don't have any interest in flying with somebody when I have my life, their life, and passengers' lives in my hand. I have no interest flying with somebody that's not serious about flying. It is a lot of fun, but it is serious fun. We take the regulations and the rules serious because that's what keeps us safe. And God's word is our regulation and our rules through this life. Every single word of it. I preached a message not long ago about this, about some of the things we think about people make you know we talk about standards people god has a standard god has a standard of dress a deportment of your life there's no doubt about it but he also the bible talks about more about love loving one another than anything else that's the number one thing by far that jesus said sets us apart that people know we're christian is our love one to another one of the worst things you can see is in a church in any organization you get in an organization, you think everybody loves one another, and then you hang out with these people, and they start cutting these people down over here. That's, that is sin. That's one of the regulations of, of the Bible right there. Don't, don't be party to that. Don't be a part of that. I've been a part of some civic organizations and was an elected official for a while, and I have seen that destroy nearly an entire city and plans for the move, moving forward of an entire city is that getting behind each other's back and cutting each other down and stabbing each other in the back. And, that, and, and that's in, in the church, in some churches. Don't don't ever, don't ever let that be a part of, of this church, of your life. It's so easy to get caught up in that. But every word in God's word is for us to keep. Don't make up your own religion. I've heard this. Well, that's not my personality. You know, well, that's, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of a take charge person, you know, and I... That's a bunch of baloney. You know, Brother, Brother Hayford went over to Korea and they, with my dad years ago, and they didn't want to come down to the altar and pray. And Brother Che told Brother Hayford, he said, well, that's just our culture. We're very dignified. You know, we don't pray. And Brother Hayford just told me, he said, no, it's not your culture. It's carnality. He said, if you're serious about serving God, come down and seek in front of everybody at the altar, you know. And they did. They started coming forward and seeking. But it's really easy for us when it affects our, it's easy to pick on other people when we see them not lining up to God's word, but it's a different story when we see things like, well, I'm kind of involved in gossip, but that's my personality. You know, I, you know, oh, I, you know, I want the best for him. I'm just trying to warn other people about him. Don't, don't let the devil lead you down that road. That will ruin your witness. That will ruin your witness to this world. Be a, 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 a student of the word and be approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. If you get involved in stuff like that, guess what? You're going to be ashamed. Your testimony is going to die. Nobody's going to want what you've got. If I heard that in, in, in any organization, that just kills the mood, so to speak. You can't believe what? I thought you guys were friends. I thought what? Now you're cutting them down. Don't be a part of that. Love one another. Help one another. Support each other and spread the word of God in this world. This world, my friend, is dying by the millions and many of them have no idea that they're on their way to hell. Let's reach out. Be approved unto God. Study to show yourself. Study God's word. Know how and when to deal with people. And if you're like, I don't profess that I know how or when to deal with people, but I'm studying to do that. I'm reading books, reading God's word, praying, God, help me. Help me be like that man on the bridge, standing, willing to give his life and look like a crazy drug addict out there because he knew if you get past me, you're going to go off the ditch and, or off the bridge 
and into the, into the lake there. Let us study to show ourselves approved unto God. Don't let the world water down your religion. We have something that nobody else has. I have never been happier in my entire life than with a clean conscience, a clean heart, and knowing that I'm free of all sin. I don't have to make excuses for any of my sins because there aren't any. God delivered me from everyone. There's, we're working with people, dealing with people. You have neighbors that believe me. They feel the condemnation that we once felt. They want deliverance from that don't let the devil ruin your testimony testify to this world be a workman approved that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth Love it.